The following program is an MLWRadio.com production. New York City. Something to wrestle with. Bruce Pritchard. Live. I thought it was no work. Something to wrestle with live show is even better in person. The show was really funny. Hey New York, Something to Wrestle With Live is coming to you. Sunday, August 20th at the Gramercy Theater at 12.30 p.m. I recommend coming to any live show. I haven't laughed that hard in a while. The first show on Saturday sold out, so we added a second on Sunday. Come see Bruce and Conrad live and in living color, baby. You never know what they're going to say. You never know what surprises may be in store. And they're going to talk about things that they can't talk about in the air. You're not going to want to miss this show. It was so great. It was a great experience. August 20th, 2017, at the Gramercy Theater in New York, New York. Something to wrestle with, Bruce Pritchard, live. We had a really good time. Oh, yeah. Today we're going to be talking about wrestling with debt. How can our listeners lower their monthly payments or consolidate their debt? Savewithbruce.com makes saving money easy. I was hoping to talk to Bruce. When you save money with First Family Mortgage and something to wrestle with Bruce Pritchard, you deal directly with us. Oh, yeah. Well, you don't need perfect credit, uh huh? Even with credit scores in the 500, SaveWithBruce.com makes saving money easy. We want to personally help you get started saving money, buying the home of your dreams, and help you get out of debt right here at SaveWithBruce.com. SaveWithBruce.com makes saving money easy. We make this fast. We make it easy. It's just a few clicks to get you started to saving money immediately. NMLS number 65084 equal housing lender. Mother. Thank you so much for donating $5 or more to musicoutreach.org. Remember, anyone who donates $5 or more will be eligible to win two Something to Wrestle With t-shirts of your choice. It's a great cause for some great kids. All you have to do is donate $5 or more to musicoutreach.org, and you could win two of your favorite Something to Wrestle With t-shirts. A special thanks to listeners who've donated already. Christian, Don, Tom, Andrew, Dan, Robert, Alan, Jared, Alan and Terrell, thank you so much for your support. Have a great day. Welcome to WHW Monday. All systems operating within normal design parameters. Tony Schiavone and Conrad Thompson talking about the great years of World Championship Wrestling, the NWA, and Jim Crockett Promotion. Engage cybernetic generation sequence. And now, let's go to the ring, and here's your co-host, Hey Hey, it's Conrad Thompson! Hey Hey, it's Conrad Thompson, and you're listening to What Happened When? Monday, right here on the MLW Radio Network. And man, have we got a show for you today. The topic nobody thought we would cover, Tony. Bobby the Brain Heenan, he's won our poll And, uh, you're going to peel back the curtain a little bit today. Are you nervous? Looking forward to this mixed emotions. What are you feeling today, Con, sir? Well, uh, first of all, Hey, Hey, Conrad, good to be talking to you. Hello, slapdicks all over the world. Thank you very much for all that you have said to me on, um, on Twitter, on Facebook, via text, all the nice calls, all the responses to all the t-shirts we've had to sell. I've given this a long and hard thought. And fuck it, I'm not going to talk about Heenan. (laughs) Swerve, bro. Bro. No, no, bro. Listen, uh, I have thought long and hard about this. Uh, I even listened to a couple of clips of Heenan talking about me on YouTube. Mm. uh, Just to kind of get a a feeling for what he was thinking. I never read his book, so I can't react to that, although you can maybe throw some things at me. Uh, But I can tell you that Heenan and I did make up, shook hands, put the past behind us after he said what he said on YouTube. Now, forward from that, I never did get back in contact with him again. And this is 2003. So he may be still mad at me because, and something that I brought up to you, I think, before, Bobby was the type of guy and is the type of guy that feels that his friends should stay in contact with him. Right. 
Uh, and I'm not good for staying in contact with people, as you know. No. Uh, it's, it's not a personal thing. It's a flaw of my personality. Uh, I, I just kind of, I don't know. I, I just kind of move on from things. I, I'm not a good. Well, it's worth mentioning, you know, as we're taping this, we're taping this, um, on a Sunday afternoon. Right. And, and you're in Syracuse, New York. You have been working all day doing baseball and, you know, we're, we're trying to fit this podcast schedule around my crazy work and personal life and you're still on the road all the time. So I think you get a little bit of a pass for not being as maybe in touch with others because you know, you, you got all these irons in the fire. So you're a busy dude. Well, Hey, and I appreciate you, you see you saying that and I am busy, but I've also been the type of person, anybody who really knows me knows that I'd really, I'm a kind of a private person and I really don't, do much as far with the exception of work and go home and back then it was hanging out with kids now it's hanging out with Lois and the dogs and I kind of keep to myself uh, sometimes I'll get the itch and I will call some friends I'll, I'll give you a person of an example uh, I've been on a road trip to Allentown Pennsylvania and here in Syracuse New York Allentown is not too far away from my father's where my father grew up where the uh, Shivani's the Italians came over the boat and uh, went to this town called Rosetta, Pennsylvania, and established this town back in 1912. Uh, that's where my father was born. I reconnected with three of my cousins that I hadn't seen in 15 years. Now, in those 15 years, I knew how to get in touch with my cousins, but I didn't. So that's just the, the way it will, And they didn't get in touch with me either. So that's just kind of the way I am. So I stay out of touch with people. Sorry about that. I probably should stay in touch with you more than I do during the week, but that's just a part of my personality. I appreciate you, you giving me a pass on that, but we're here to talk about Bobby Heenan and we're here to talk about my relationship with him, which was a great relationship overall, uh, uh, one relationship where we really, really cared about each other. And one at the end went downhill because of big mistake that I made, uh, as a, uh, as an employee of WCW. Well, you know, I'm not really sure where we want to start on this because this is, you know, certainly one of the more controversial things we'll ever cover. And and I should say we invited everybody to join our conversation on Twitter. Uh, We have a show account at WHW Monday. uh, And several days ago we posted, and what will surely be our most controversial show ever, what do you want to ask Tony Schiavone 24 about Bobby Heenan? Just reply here. So if you haven't already, Throw us a follow on Twitter at WHW Monday. He is at Tony Schiavone 24 and I am at, Hey, 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 it's Conrad. Easy for me to say, we want to try to cover as much of this as we can. Uh, but I realize that we're going to get a lot of feedback from this. Are, are you ready in advance of that? Yeah, I, I think we are. Look, it, it comes down to this. People are either going to believe me and some of these things or believe him in some of these things. I think some of the things he said about me were done out of anger. Sure. Uh, and I think uh, some of the things that uh, that you're going to hear from me, you're going to say, well, I, I, I believe Shivani, and I don't believe Heenan. There's a lot of Heenan supporters out there who have sent me very unkind things in the past who believe everything that Bobby Heenan said. Right. That's fine. Only thing I can tell you this is I'm going to tell you the truth about my relationship with Bobby Heenan. And if there's some things that I don't remember, I'll tell you I don't remember. Uh, so, yeah, I'm ready. Let's, uh, let's, let's plow into this thing because uh, I'm, I'm ready. I feel like we should first, you know, give the obligatory preamble here. Um, Bobby Heenan is the greatest manager of all time. Would you disagree with that, Tony? I would not disagree with that. His WWF work he did, whether it was – you know, taking bumps for the guys. And he was one of the first guys I, I saw really master this. And obviously he was the, the first guy because I was a kid watching, but he would wrestle like a manager and he would manage like a wrestler. So he was the best of both worlds. He was phenomenal at what he did. Uh, obviously we all remember his famous one liners from the WWF and we're going to touch on that stuff briefly. But none of nothing we're covering today is is an indication that either of us feel differently about Bobby's position. I wasn't there. Tony was. 
Uh, Bobby has made some pretty public statements about Tony. We're going to respond to those today, but I feel like if we're not kind of tiptoeing here, then we're going to be the bad guys because of Bobby's, first of all, beloved status in the wrestling community, which is clearly well-deserved. Uh, and secondly, his current health situation. We're not trying to kick him in when he's down, so to speak. Would no. you agree with that, Tony? Yeah, I would agree with that. Let me let me uh, further this by saying two things that I've thought about saying, and I want to say here. Bobby Heenan was the funniest man I've ever met, by far. Bobby Heenan could have been a stand-up comedian, uh, and in many ways he was. He was also a very close friend at one time. Plus, as I, and I've not seen Bobby since his health has really declined. Last time I saw him and talked to him was 2003, and his voice was having some problems. And I'll talk about that meeting that we had in a moment. But when I look at him now, you know the first thing I think? And I know Bobby's probably too proud to even say this, or Cindy's even too proud to even say this. I'm saying the WWE should take care of him. Well, we don't know what they're doing behind the scenes. We don't know what they're doing behind the scenes, but damn it, they should if they're not. He meant that much to the business. No, I totally and he, agree. And he, and he meant that much to us. Uh, and they're making a lot of money, as we know. If they're not, they should be. And I certainly hope they are. Because every time I see the pictures of Bobby, it breaks my heart. It really, really does. Uh, as much as some of the things that he said broke my heart, but not really that as much as some of the things he said. He was at Wrestle uh, at WrestleCon. I didn't see him. I've had a lot of fans say, well, why don't I pick up the phone and call Bobby? I don't have his number. That's not an excuse. I could probably find it. But I know Bobby can't talk right now. The best thing for me to do would be to see Bobby in person. Um, so be that as there's our feeling to Bobby. I love him. Always did. I made the mistake that split us up. But as a result, he said some things about me that weren't true. And I can understand because he was very angry. Well, let's kind of start from the beginning. Uh, I assume the first time you met Bobby was when you went to work with the World Wrestling Federation in 1989. Would that be fair to say? That is fair to say, yes. Can you tell us about what that meeting was like? Of course, this is a WCW podcast, but we're talking about, you know, not WCW right. more so than the guy and your relationship with the guy. What was your relationship like in working with him in, in your WWF run? We fans have seen where he would kind of rib a little on prime time. He'd be joshing with gorilla and say that, uh, he was upset that gorilla had this, she of own, or, you know, he would right. mispronounce your name funny and say that you were the worst right. and blah, 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 just over right. the top ribbing. But I don't know what the real relationship was like. What was your interaction with him? What was your experience with him when you were there? Uh, I, I first met him in the studio when we were doing primetime wrestling and I would, do, when we did primetime wrestling and I would comment over some of those matches, uh, Gorilla Monsoon and Bobby Heenan were in the, the big studio and Lord Alfred and I were in the sound booth. Uh, and I met him there. They took Bobby off of uh, WWE challenge and put me on in his place. If you'll recall, because they wanted to give Heenan his own show. And they wanted to move Heenan off of that. And as Bruce Pritchard had told me at that time, kind of elevate Bobby more than just an announcer. So they took him off challenge. They put me on with Gorilla Monsoon. I, I'm, I know Bobby didn't have a problem with that because Bobby and I got, got along quite well. Uh, we hung out a little bit at WrestleMania 5. We did something. Uh, uh, we did a couple of uh, videos together on WrestleMania 5. He was willing to do anything. And... Uh, and I was in awe of Bobby because, again, as I think I've well established on, on this program, I was a gigantic wrestling fan. I watched the WWF and, and loved their stuff that they did. I loved Heenan. I loved Okerlund. I loved uh, all the work that they did. They Some of the shit they did just absolutely uh, knocked my socks off because it was so funny. So we had a pretty good relationship at the beginning, uh, although it was a relationship that really didn't see that much of each other. Because I worked in the office and Bobby, you know, lived in Florida and Bobby just came in to do prime time or, uh, he came in to do some, some other stuff. And I didn't really see him that much. I only started seeing him that much and hanging out with him a lot when he came into WCW. 
So let's talk about that. Uh, Bobby wrote a book in 2002 that I highly recommend, especially if you're a Bobby Heenan fan, you should go out of your way to see it. Um, you can still actually pick it up on Amazon. If you'll just type in Bobby Heenan book, it'll pop up. Um, if you're a Bobby Heenan fan, it's a good time. Um, I want to read you some excerpts from the WCW side that he wrote about, and then just kind of let you respond if that's okay. Sure. The name of the book, in case you're following along at home is Bobby, the brain wrestling's bad boy tells all it came out in 2002. Uh, you can pick it up on the cheap. You can actually get hardcover copies of this book on Amazon for under three bucks right now. Um, so here's what Bobby has to say. In WCW, I began what was the worst six years of my life. It was more unprofessional than any place I'd ever worked. I knew going in that it wasn't going to be the same as the WWF. I knew guys who were there and had told me that it was run like a circus. I went there for the money and to be closer to home. The first week I was in the booth to do voiceovers for television shows with Tony Schiavone. I watched a guy throw a drop kick and it missed by about four or five inches. Tony didn't say anything. I try to cover it by saying, quote, you know, Tony, a lot of people don't have that resiliency when they see a drop kick to get out of the way and move back. Cut. Tony said to the production crew, he looked at me and said, don't cover it up. Don't bring any attention to it. Inevitably that missed drop kick would show up in highlights after the match. Do you recall this particular incident that he's discussing here? And can you kind of explain a, was it true? And B, what was the philosophy that Turner had handed down to you in those situations? Let me, uh, let me start by saying that I agree with Bobby, uh, that we all felt anybody who came from the WWF to WCW was in for a big shock and we were all let down by it. Uh, so I agree with that, but I can tell you right now, that never happened. Me saying cut. I, I don't, I, I listen, I, I just went with the match, always went with the match and thought whatever he did was wonderful. Help me understand when you that, say that never, that uh, Conrad, that never happened. Never happened. So you do believe that when a guy misses a drop kick and it's playing on camera, I mean, mm-hmm. you have to acknowledge it. You've got to say something to cover it up. Would that be, your philosophy? Well, yeah, I think you got to, you just got to move on. Uh, and I think if Bobby, whatever Bobby said, if I just went with it and just kept moving on. So you started that explanation by saying that everybody was in for a little bit of a shock and a disappointment when they come to WCW. Do you remember right. first hearing that he was coming and What was the reaction? Because he leaves the WWF in December of 93 and he tells everybody on the way out that he wants to get into Hollywood and he thinks he can do some commercials and stuff like that. Uh, Vince would say, you know, that he was just burnt out, but then of course he debuts with WCW, not too terribly long later. Can you speak to how he came in? Did, Did you ever hear any sort of rumor innuendo about how that deal was put together? I did not hear anything. I remember the first time I knew that Bobby was coming in. Uh, we had an office, uh, where, uh, I had this one office and there was this little, uh, office next to mine. And I remember walking out of my office and seeing him walk down the hallway. That's the first time that I saw him there. And I went, holy shit, hugged him, said, how you doing? And, uh, and that's how it started. I did not hear anything about Bobby Heenan coming. And that's exactly how Okerlund came in too. It feels a little weird in hindsight, you know, even when you watch the WWE produce DVD, you know, he acts as if when he's given this big send off on raw that he was burnt out on the road. And that's even Vince McMahon's testimony on the disc. And he wanted to just try his hand in Hollywood. Well, that that's December 6th, 1993 by late January 94. So the very next month, all right, uh, he's here in for WCW and, and I guess he's here to replace Jesse Ventura. Is that the way you remember? Uh, I didn't know that at that time, but it apparently was the was the uh, point because apparently Eric would had grown tired of Jesse. 
So when this happens and, and, and you get the word that he's coming in, is there any sort of, um, I mean, cause obviously you're on that side of the deal. Do you think this levels up your presentation from WCW or is it just business as usual? Are you even the least bit job scared that this guy's coming in? Obviously it's play by play and color. It's totally different, but you, know, you personally, given the way you felt about the WWF and you see one of the bigger stars in the business making their way down, do you have mixed emotions about that? I have no mixed emotions. Uh, as a matter of fact, I, I'm pretty excited about it. That that Bobby Heenan, one of the biggest stars and with the greatest manager ever, would become a part of WCW. To me, it was just again us stacking our roster with with the big talent. I mean, how could why and how in the world would I be uh, upset or scared for my job that Bobby Heenan was coming in? Well, it's just a time when you know business is not necessarily doing gangbusters, and you guys are not that far away from a lot of cost cutting measures. And right. you got to wonder, hey, is this going to affect my money? I would think a lot of people would think that's a natural question to ask themselves. Yeah, that may be a natural. You know, uh, again, uh, I was concerned about the state of WCW almost daily. Right. And I and I, I think I mentioned this on a future podcast. There wasn't a day that went by that it wouldn't have surprised me for them to say, oh, we're out of business. Uh, or, whoops, Turner said we don't want to do it anymore, as in Turner Broadcasting. Uh, that never surprised me because the way the business was run. Uh, but the actual Heenan coming in kind of told me that we were trying to make a pretty good run of it. Uh, again, I, I do need to say this, that believe this or not, I don't care. When I worked in WCW, Conrad, I didn't watch the WWF stuff. Right. The only The only thing about the WWF that I knew was what I was told. There was a lot of people who watched it, a lot of people who kept up with it. Maybe it would, it would have behooved me to keep up with it, but I've often been I've often thought that to do my job, I needed to do my job and not worry about what the competition was doing. Uh, and that's how I approached my job. So I was I do not know anything about Bobby Heenan's exit from Raw or sure. Prime Time or whatever it was it was. I just saw him show up one day and thought, holy shit, here he is. And I thought it was a great thing. Let's talk about the clash of the champions where Brian Pillman, uh, kind of went into business for himself and messed with Bobby. Uh, yeah. Bobby was really focused on calling the match from the monitor, which is what all professional commentators are supposed to do. You're supposed to call right. what the people at home are watching, right, Tony? Right. Exactly. I, I never hardly ever looked at the action. I always looked at the monitor and, th and that's one of the reasons we, we put the uh, set in the back, if you'll recall, and had our back to the matches, uh, back when they had the old nitro set because it wasn't important for us to look at the ring. It was important for us to look at the monitor. So he's, he's staring at the monitor. Pillman approaches him. He doesn't see Pillman coming because he's focused on the monitor. Uh, Bobby had just had neck surgery the prior year. So he's very sensitive and everybody knew that, you know, to not mess with him. Someone starts to take tug at his jacket. Like they're trying to take his jacket off. He's not sure if it's a fan or what's going on. And he says live on the air, what the fuck are you doing? Right. And he panics and starts to storm off. Uh, eventually he, d he talks with Bischoff after Bischoff says he didn't like what Pillman had done. They edited it from all the replays. They try to make chicken salad, so to speak, but it's natural. And Bobby writes in his book that he was nervous. He might get fired for that. You were there. Uh, did you think there would be any sort of significant heat on Bobby or is this something he gets a pass because Pillman had kind of done this on his own? Well, he got a pass because Pillman had done it on his own. And as we know, Pillman had been kind of a out of touch, crazy type character and, and doing some crazy things uh, because it happened on light TV. And because of, you know, how the way I am, I, I thought it was tremendous. I thought it was absolutely funny. And I thought it was funnier because Jeff Carr uh, one of the Turner Broadcasting uh, executives was there that night, and Jeff always thought that he kind of ran the wrestling business and didn't. And I just thought it was very, very funny, and it was Heenan being Heenan. Uh, and I and I told Bobby, I said, you know, it, I don't think it's a big deal, man. I, I you know, I, I know how paranoid people can get in the business, but I don't think it's a big deal. Right. I I think it's it's okay. We just keep moving on, and uh, so uh, I know he came back, and and I know. When he started talking again, he was very upset. 
about what he had said and very concerned he had said it. But I also know he was very, very sensitive about his neck and was afraid that Pillman may do something nutty, as we all know that Pillman could do. He wrote in his book, uh, quote, I didn't like the idea that they didn't tell us what was going on. You never felt wanted there. You always felt like the foster kid from a domestic dispute who just had to stay somewhere for a month. I made friends there who were professional and nice, but other than that, most of them were lucky to be working and have a job. They didn't have the training mentality or desire to do anything right. They were all very lucky with a hillbilly company. Do you, do you have a response to that? That's funny. <laughs> That's funny. He's probably right. There was a lot of people that shouldn't have been in the wrestling business. Look, we all came, he came and I came and I, and I was with the Crockett's. Then I went to WWE and, and Oakland came. We all came from a very professionally run business that was run by a man who knew what he was doing and he had the right idea and it was his company and was run. It was organized correctly. And then we came to this business that was not run properly. And it was a big time culture shock for us. I think some of the things he said in there, calling it a hillbilly company is, is right, but it's also Heenan being Heenan. So I think it's very, very funny. There were some professional people there. I'd like to think I was one, but as we move along here and in his book, apparently I was not. Uh, he continued about WCW after production meetings in the WWF, Vince McMahon would say, let's go have some fun. After right. WCW production meetings, we'd say, let's go see if there's any free food left. But you'd go, <laughs> and it would all be gone. Uh, people from production would walk by you, and they would never say hello or talk to you. There was this makeup girl who was promoted to executive producer because she was, quote-unquote, taking it from one of the other producers. She looked like Mount Rushmore and smelled like Grey Poupon. She couldn't put her own face on. She was going to make me look good. Uh, first of all, before we keep going... Who's he talking about here? He's talking about Annette Yoder. And uh, who was Annette Yoder taking it from? Uh, Just say a name. We all, okay. All right. We all assumed, again, we all assumed. Rumor and innuendo. You were in innuendo. She was taking it from Craig Leathers. Okay. No one, no one saw that happen, but that's what, the, that's what the prevailing rumor was. I take it she wore a lot of makeup herself? Uh, yeah. Was she a large lady? No. Did she smell like Grey Poupon? Uh, <laughs> I don't know. That's a damn good line, though. <laughs> it's it's a phenomenal. He keeps going. There was another girl that worked there whom we called Wendy Turnbuckle. She was right. just a slob. She was clumsy and always spilling water. She'd grab yeah. a rag to clean it up, and she'd pull her headsets off. One day, I saw her at the airport. Apparently, Wendy was a diabetic. She was lying on the floor of the terminal and gave herself a shot in the ass through her jeans. Of course, there was a croissant from Burger King lying next to her. Picture a big pig lying on the floor with a needle sticking out of her ass. I leaned over to the guy sitting next to me and said, usually when they use those dart guns, they'll take the tusks right off her. <laughs> Do you remember Wendy Turnbuckle? Yes. Who is Wendy Turnbuckle? <laughs> Wendy Turnbuckle was Wendy Turner. I named her Turnbuckle. Uh, and she did some clumsy things, but Wendy was a pretty capable girl, I thought. Uh, and uh, she uh, copied, uh, did the typing for, uh, as we moved along, for Annette and, and uh, copied. She was just kind of the office girl for Annette that traveled with us. She was a diabetic. Uh, I don't remember the time that she was laying on the floor. But if he didn't saw that, <laughs> I should read this book, man. This is funny shit. Hey, this is Heenan at his best, man. It's worth mentioning uh, that Wendy Turner is still in the biz. She works for the NBC Sports Network. She's been there for 11 years and three months. Uh, this was formerly Versus. Before that, she worked for uh, FSN South. So she has went on and maintained. You can check her out on LinkedIn. Uh, uh, are you sure? That's it, Wendy Turner? I'm, Same one? Yeah. As I scroll down, I mean, it's on her resume here. WCW 1997-2001. Okay. Uh, she worked in programming. She was a stage oh, manager yeah. and programming assistant. So yeah. that's her. I, th there was a, uh, there was, uh, you can go back and look. I think it's on, uh, it's on YouTube, but you go back and look that one time she just walked right in front of us. <laughs> oh, I, I have seen that. We're yeah. on the air. You've seen that. <laughs> yeah. Listen, I, uh, who was she taking it from? Was she taking it from anybody? No, 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 no. I don't think so. 
uh, Bobby wrote in his book, everyone hated their jobs. It was the funniest place. For example, if someone was in charge of tapes and someone was in charge of pins, the person in charge of tapes would say, don't touch that tape. I'm in charge of that. I have to move that. The person in charge of pins would say, would you like to use my pen? The tape person would say, I don't want to get involved in that. They would only do what they had to do. No one would ever help anybody. The production yeah. department wouldn't show replays with a guy coming off the top rope onto a table. They'd show a guy locking up at the start of the match. They missed the good stuff. WCW always wanted to start a match in progress or show someone coming out of a limo. You don't see the Super Bowl start with a guy running the ball. You have to have an opening and the announcers have to talk about what you're going to see. Set the stage for it. People who turn on wrestling and see a guy coming out of the car and walking into the building think they've missed something. They don't know where they're at in the show. So some of this feels a little bit like Bobby's just, you know, difference of opinion about the way wrestling should be presented. And the other is he felt like WCW was very much a, a negative culture where nobody was willing to go above board. Everybody wanted to do the bare minimum. Is that a fair assessment in your opinion? I, I, I'm not going to, I'm not going to say that everybody was just doing the bare minimum. I just think that there was a lot of people that didn't know what they were doing. Right. Uh, and Bobby and I, and Mike Tanay and I, and Tanay can attest to this, and G- and uh, Okerlund and I, and even Lee Marshall and I, when we all hung out together, we would always crack on how shitty things were. We would always make, you know, funny, and I can't remember th- them exactly, funny comments about how fucked up this company is. For Bobby and I, who were actually there, and Gene, who were actually here in the WWE, we kind of knew what we were talking about. Uh so I, I think he's a fair on that assessment that things were fucked up. I think I've mentioned that to you many times on this sure. on this podcast. And I think Heenan's right on about a lot of the people just were out of their element about, uh, okay. And, and I think maybe Heenan has said this before. You've mentioned this before. There were a lot of people there who did not love wrestling. Did not love wrestling. Right. I think you had to love it. Sure. I really do. And I, and I know I loved it. I know Heenan did. I know Tanae did. Uh, and the boys did because that was their business. But there are a lot of production people that just did not. Uh, Heenan writes, WCW's philosophy was to double cross everyone, fool everyone. Uh, right. And he would say no one would make a decision on anything. And the decisions they did make were bad. They made Kevin Nash the booker along with Terry Taylor and some other guys and Nash went out and beat Goldberg, the hottest thing WCW had. Nash shouldn't have beat a man that was over like Goldberg was. The time to beat Goldberg was when it was time to pass the torch. Andre did that for Hogan. He let Hogan beat him. Plus, WCW needed to go all the way with Goldberg and build him up. But they didn't have that capacity. So he continues to criticize um, the way Goldberg was booked. And then they talk about, he, he writes about the finger poke of doom and he writes all that with 40,000 people in WCW's own backyard of Atlanta, the home of the company. After that show, Mike Tanay and I told Tony that the handwriting was on the wall. He shot back with you bunch of paranoid sons of bitches. How are the Braves doing Tony? Do you have a response? No, I don't remember that at all. Uh, he could have, and I could have said something to the effect of tongue in cheek, uh, but uh, I don't remember that. Do you remember having a conversation with anybody about the finger poke of doom after, or hearing oh, yeah. what Brain's opinion well, we all, was? Yeah, we all thought he was just was fucking idiotic. Sure. Yeah, I don't think there was any question. I don't think. Well, I know I didn't like it. Who did? Right. Uh, so for me to say, you guys are idiotic. Uh, I, I don't know. Maybe I was trying to be positive or maybe I was pulling their leg, but I, I, I know I agreed with how shitty things were. The, the, the thing in wrestling that's always kind of, I don't know, it's confusing to someone who's not in the business. And even sometimes when you're paying attention intently, it's still con- confusing. I imagine it feels like a lot of wrestling is just based on knowledge. Oh, I know something you don't know, or uh, everyone wants to prove that they're the smartest guy in the room, I guess is what I mean. And it feels like him writing this here is almost insinuating 
that Tony or Tony didn't know this was the end of WCW and that this was bad, but I did. And he knows right. so little about wrestling. Now he does baseball. How are the Braves doing, Tony? Is that the way right. you read that? No, I, I don't read that. I don't. I don't read that at all. I uh, I look. Bobby's doing a lot of armchair quarterbacking here. Sure. And the thing about being an armchair quarterback is you're always right. Being an armchair quarterback, uh, and I can understand that. Uh, I, I know he is has gone on to say that I'm just a minor league baseball announcer, which he's right. Uh, I, I think some of the stuff he was heaping on me was because of the anger. I still think that. Um, but, but I'm just saying I mean, is that it, this is an ugly side of Bobby Heenan to say, how are the Braves doing, Tony? Because you could say some horrible things in return right now. But Yeah. You know, what I'm not could, playing that game, though. Right. That's not like me. You know me. That's not like me. Sure. Uh, and uh, it's it's stupid to try to. To try well, well, it's stupid to try to out heal probably the best heel ever in the business. Right. Number one, and, and number two, it, it gets you nowhere. It gets you nowhere. He, he takes a lot of, uh, I don't know, a lot of time to give you a peek into some other sides of the business. He talks about Mike Tanay's wife, Karen, and he yeah. refers to her as fingers. He says, wow. any salt shaker on a restaurant table went home with her. Um, <laughs> so he, he's. Why, why? Why would it, did he write anything about Lois? Uh, we're getting there. Do you, do <laughs> really? You, <laughs> do you do you remember? Uh, no, no. Okay, I don't remember that about Karen Tanay. God, no fingers. Well, at least it uh, pops you. At least he it's so funny. Fu- he is he is a funny son of a bitch. He talks uh, about how much he you know enjoyed uh, going back and forth with Gorilla, and that Lee Marshall kind of would try to do it to him. But he had to play like he was scared of Gorilla because Gorilla was so much bigger and was a former wrestler. But that right. wasn't going to work with Lee Marshall because, in his opinion, Lee Marshall was a dumpy announcer. So he wasn't going to act like he was scared there. But he enjoyed right. picking on Mike because Mike knew so much about wrestling. He wrote, Mike is a real smart guy. Everything I needed to know, I'd ask Mike because he eavesdrops on the wrestling world. He always did his homework but was dissatisfied in WCW. He would ask questions and people would just scratch their heads. It was fun working with Mike, and I respect him and Fingers a lot. Wait a minute. Wow. Where's my wallet? So, <laughs> even when he he's buried, Mike, poop. but he respected Mike, but calls his wife a kleptomaniac. <laughs> That's class. Isn't that awesome? <laughs> yeah, it's tremendous. He buried uh, to hire Steve McMichael and called him a mark for Steve McMichael. And he says that. Bischoff had blind devotion to McMichael and ignored any shortcomings. He says McMichael was not a good wrestling announcer, and it's not because he was not a good announcer. Uh, it was just that he would say things like, quote, that guy's going to kill him when you should never say that. Um, would you, th- how would you, we've never really talked about him in this regard. Did you have a conversation with Bobby about working with Mongo? No, not at all. I, that was not of uh, why, why would I? He would talk about uh, with it, with except you're going up to Bobby say, uh, did you think he sucked Bobby? I mean, we all knew Mongo wasn't that great of an announcer, but there were still some things and maybe I'm looking for the, uh, the positive silver lining here. Yeah. yeah. There are still some things that Bobby and Mongo did back and forth, which was pretty funny. Uh, and, and that was all because Bobby was so good at what he did. Um, but no, I never did talk to him about, Mongo shortcomings. He wrote in the book, up until the time I arrived in WCW, I never heard a wrestler say, let's go out there and put on a bad show to screw the people. In WCW, I heard a couple of guys say that they had a bad match and they hoped they killed the town so they didn't have to come back. Whether there were a million people in those stands or just 50, just entertain them. The fact that there were only 50 people in the stands was not their fault. It was the promotion's fault because they were not good enough on television to get people interested to come out and watch. Did you hear talk like that, or is this Bobby freestyling? This is Bobby freestyling, but this is Bobby's. Uh, I, I think this is showing Bobby's knowledge of the business, wouldn't wouldn't you? Sure, but the idea that yeah. the guys are sitting around saying, "I hope we killed the town," that's hard for me to imagine. Yeah. I hope um, we killed the town. He talked a lot about the clicks in WCW. He says that Kevin Sullivan was the booker one week, then it was Kevin Nash, and then Terry Taylor. He specifically wrote. Then Terry Taylor, who would never tell anybody the truth. 
end quote. So Terry Taylor's got heat fucking everywhere. Uh, yeah. Jimmy Hart would help. Arn Anderson would try to do his best. Mike Graham would try as well. But no one was told anything. Wooden group wouldn't talk to another group. And one group kept secrets from another group. At Vince's production meetings, we would go over every part of what's going on. Anything to add, anything to subtract. It would go on for two to three hours. I'd go into WCW production meetings and they would read us a paper and that was it. I could read. Sometimes we would go out there for television and we would get a format sheet until the second or third match. WCW would also try to do these ridiculous worked shoots. One day in the hallway, DDP got in a fight with Buff Bagwell. They wanted everybody to believe it was real. They were working, fighting in the hall in front of the boys. Dave Finley, one of the other wrestlers and I, were sitting there laughing our asses off because they were using worked punches. Um, Do you remember this feeling of of distrust and you can't believe what anybody's saying and everybody's got their own little click and you know this kind of whisper campaign that people had was that a fair assessment and would you say that once upon a time you were in bobby's camp or were you guys never in the same little group no i went so once upon a time i was in bobby's camp if you can call it bobby's camp i know what he's talking about uh the event happened at the pepsi center in colorado didn't i touch on that yeah. one time before mm-hmm. that that ddp and uh and Bagwell got into a fight. I didn't see the fight. I think Heenan may have been there with Dave Finley. I didn't see the fight, but I didn't buy it either. I didn't believe it. I knew they were trying to work the boys, uh, and they thought if they worked the boys, then they would have an they would have an authentic angle. So I didn't believe any of the shit that they did. What what Bobby is talking about here about one guy being the booker one week, one guy being the next, and hiding things from people. I think a lot of the hiding things from people was just incompetence. I don't think it was kayfabe or trying to say, I know it and you don't. I just think it was lack of communication and incompetence of how to the, do it. The company, you know, to a Southern expression is the light, the left hand didn't know what the right hand was doing. Exactly. Not necessarily yeah. out of spite. Just, you just don't have your shit together. Exactly. Um, he would continue the WWF is a wrestling company that needs television to survive. WCW was a wrestling company that just happened to be on TV. and was owned by a television company. We were the only thing making them money. We had better ratings than the Atlanta Braves, but WCW was always the whore sister of the time Warner family. The kind that goes out every night and turns tricks and makes money. The family yeah, lives right. in a, the family lives in a big home, drives new cars and dresses nice. But they don't want to tell anybody where they're getting the money. How do you feel about that? He's exactly right. He's spot on with all that. He has verbalized some of the things that I was that I've always been thinking. Um, he's verbalized. He's verbalized, Conrad, many of the things that we've talked about since January. Wouldn't you agree? No, absolutely, totally. Yeah. Uh, he talks a little bit about his relationship with Eric Bischoff. He says, sure, Nitro was number one for 83 weeks, but that was because of Vince McMahon. He was running those vignettes of Hogan being old and Savage being old, and it made people aware of where Hogan and everybody were. So the fans started watching WCW. During that time, the announcers were criticizing the WWF product on the air. I never knocked Vince one time. Eric Bischoff even asked me once, are you still working for him? And I said, no, Eric, I'm not working for him. The reason I don't knock him is I spent 10 years there. How stupid would I look to rip on the WWF? I'm hired by this company to put over this product. Sears people don't talk about JC Penny. Do you remember that conversation that he had with Eric about not knocking Vince or the product? I don't remember that conversation, but I remember us Heenan and today and all of us talking about the fact that what we were doing was wrong. Uh, I always said, I use the analogy that Coke never talks about Pepsi, right? McDonald's never talks about Burger King. That was Eric's thing. He wanted to do that. A lot of the fans, uh, you know, always talk about the, the line that I said, but if they go back and they watch nitro before I started doing nitro, Eric was giving shit away all the time. That was, that was how he did things. That's the way he felt. And I knew Heenan didn't like it. He wrote Bischoff was even challenging Vince to matches in the ring. If that match yeah. ever happened, Vince would have killed him. Eric Bischoff is like every other guy that got into wrestling that didn't have the wrestling mentality or wasn't from the business. This guy was a kickboxer. I always called him Kung Fu Charlie. 
He won different colored belts from some strip mall doing Taekwondo with a bunch of 11 year old kids, barely touching each other. Bischoff never did anything but kickbox. He threatened people. He was going to kick this guy's ass and this and that. I never had a problem with Eric. He gave me three contracts and two raises, but he just wasn't a friendly guy. He even admitted it when I asked him to have a few beers with me. To put it simply, Eric Bischoff wanted to be Vince McMahon. Vince is Neiman Marcus. Bischoff is Walmart. He just couldn't be Vince. He didn't have it. Maybe he does for other things, but not for wrestling. He told me one day, I'm going to put a stake in Vince McMahon's heart, pull it out, and do it again. That stake is located in somebody else's body, and it's in a different area. So he's pretty critical here yeah, about good, Bischoff. Um, Bischoff made that comment about the stake uh, when we were backstage uh, at uh, the Target Center in Minnesota. We all were around for that. He well also, documented. He was very critical about Bischoff not sharing the creative, and he felt like this was unprofessional. Um, and he says they wouldn't tell us the finishes of the matches of the angles that were supposed to air. Bischoff justified that by saying, quote, we want you to react like it was a shoot. I told him if it was a shoot, you know what we would do? We wouldn't say anything because we've never seen one in the ring. Maybe it'll be better to tell us so we can enhance the product. We didn't even know that Hulk Hogan was turning at the bash at the beach in Daytona during the summer of 96. They kept him in a car the whole time. We didn't even know he was in it. I knew he was there because I saw Brutus Beefcake, who was a longtime friend of Hogan's, hanging around. They were so touchy on Turner. I used to make midget, midget jokes when I worked for the WWF. Once I said, don't ever touch a midget. You never know where they've been. I saw the Haiti kid doing sit-ups the other day under a 57 Chevy. <laughs> Nitro had a, mid, a Mexican midget battle royal, and Eric approached me and said, don't say anything insulting. First of all, <laughs> First of all, Eric, I said... You're not talking to Ray Heenan, but to the character of Bobby Heenan. There are 12 midgets out there with masks on. What is Bobby Heenan going to say? Eric said, you can't. Midgets will write in. I told Eric, they can't reach the mail slot. (laughs) He says, Bobby, be careful. What am I supposed to do? They all got in the ring, and the only thing I could come up was, this looks like a ride at the daycare center. (laughs) <laughs> and actually, uh, to correct his book, he said it looks like a riot at okay. a daycare center because because I've stolen that and used it. But I, I think you know it is interesting that they hire Bobby Heenan to be a commentator, but they kind of don't want him to do that because the idea yeah. behind being a commentator is you're supposed to enhance the product. You're supposed to make what we're seeing sound, look, and feel bigger. And right. if you don't know what's coming and you're out of the loop on the finish then it's really difficult for you to make sure that you're doing that to the best of your abilities because you have no time to prepare and think about where you want to go. It's just all right off the cuff. And yeah. then they were kind of critical of him being insulting, which is just a Bobby Heenan staple. I mean, he's the king of the put downs. Do you remember yeah. having any sort of conversations with him about this, not knowing the finished business? He has accused you in an RF video shoot interview by saying that you felt like knowledge is power and yeah. that you didn't want to share finishes and yeah. that y- you felt like if you knew who was going over, that that made you better or smarter or positioned you differently. Um, yeah. and you were kind of blessed to know, and he wasn't and he and he referred to you in that regard as being a half-assed producer. Mm-hmm. Can you respond to, Cause here's what I think, and I'm freestyling here, but my theory okay. is you didn't fucking know yourself and because Bischoff not. just didn't tell you guys. And so right. rather than make yourself look like an ass and say, I don't know, you just repeated, Hey, we're just going to call it like a shoot. Don't worry about it. So it's, it's, it's the That's, company line more so than I, nanny, right. nanny, boo, boo. I know something you don't know. Right. I look, there was a time as we got near the end of stuff and things were going badly. And when Bobby was still doing our, our, uh, before it was me and Madden and, uh, and, uh, Scott Hudson doing the show, it was me and Bobby and Heenan, uh, me and Bobby and, and today there were, and I was so disgusted with the product. I didn't even, I didn't even go in there in our locker room. I did not go in their locker room. And there was a thought that Tony Schiavone by not going, being in the locker room with, with today and Bobby and Lee Marshall and Gene and all that, that he was in Eric's room 
going over the finishes, keeping all the stuff for himself, and not telling us. That was not true. But that's not Bobby lying about it. That's Bobby not knowing. I stayed away from everybody. I stayed in the arena and read books. I walked around. I walked downtown. And where we were, I just completely stayed away from the business because I was so disenchanted to the business. So I never hid anything from Bobby Heenan unless I was told to hide something from Bobby Heenan. I would have. I was never told to do that. Again, it's just a lack of communication. That's all it is. Well, let's lighten the mood a little bit. He okay. wrote, I, I once told Bischoff I could save him a fortune with, with the Lucha Libres. How, he asked, quote, you're bringing 12 guys in from Mexico City. Why don't you just bring in two and keep 10 masks? They're all built the same and do the same moves. No one will know the difference. <laughs> I feel Brilliant, like right? I feel like you're yeah. on the same page. I feel like you agree with that. I do. I do. Uh, he wrote specifically that Russo and Ferraro, when they come in, they're making half a million dollars a year. He said Russo had no presence on television. He didn't dress like the executive of a company. He was wearing T-shirts and jeans, and he felt like they were overpaid. He, he specifically says they're getting half a million dollars a piece. Were they getting half a million dollars? Is that well documented? Because I don't know. That. No, they were not. Uh, according okay. to Russo, they weren't. I, I don't. Remember off the right, top did, of my head, but I think he made like three, good money. Three fifty ish, I believe, is the number Russo's okay. quoted. Um, he wrote, "Russo didn't like me. He wanted a more youthful look, like an MTV look. So he replaced me with Mark Madden, who was a loudmouth slob from Pittsburgh that liked hockey. He shouldn't have been in that job. I was with the company for six years. I missed two days of work, one for my mother in law's funeral, and one because I had strep throat." I called Tony Schiavone the day I was sick, and he said, that's okay. But Terry Taylor went nuts. He couldn't wait to hire Madden because they were both huge internet fans. They called Madden and flew him in from Pittsburgh to do Nitro. Tony double-crossed me, too. He would always say, knowledge is power, but he'd never tell you what was going on. He is a very insecure man. Now, we'll go further in a minute, but let's talk okay. about... The Russo wanted a more youthful look, so he hired Mark Madden. That never fucking made any sense to me ever. What really happened? Uh, I, I I can't uh, I can't tell you what happened, and I don't know why it happened. Uh, I ended up like I ended up enjoying working with Mark because I thought Mark played the heel quite well, but Mark was no Bobby Heenan, right? And Bobby Heenan was still the guy who had all this exposure from the WWF and was still the greatest heel announcer he and Jesse Ventura ever. So why he would get rid of Bobby Heenan and move him on, I don't know. I, I, I can't – I don't know. I can't explain that. And Heenan's right. One thing about Bobby is that I always knew about Bobby was he would never miss work. Right. He would always do his work. And so when he called me, he told me he had a strep throat, it was fine. But, of course, Terry Taylor went nuts. I, there were a lot of people in the booking committee, and I'm not going to heap all kinds of shit on Terry Taylor because we've done that already. No, but there was, all, there was a lot, a lot of people in the booking committee that didn't like my work and didn't like his work. And uh, there was always that pull and tug in that booking committee about who should be the announcers. So l let me ask you, are you saying that Terry Taylor didn't think that you should have been there either? He wanted to replace you and Bobby. I think he wanted to replace me too. I, I think that's, uh, I got a, I got a phone call in, uh, during the, uh, 1999 all-star game. Uh, the 1999 baseball all-star game was in Atlanta. And anytime that if you've ever been to an all-star game, you know that they have this gigantic collector's, uh, fair collectors uh, thing like a, going like on. a card show. A big card show. And being being a big baseball card fan, I just took the day off from work and went to the baseball card show with my with my son, Matt. And, uh, and I think Chris went too. And I got a call from from uh, Craig Leathers. And Craig said, uh, I just want you to know that there are people in the booking committee that want to replace you. Right. And I said, well, do what? I said, yeah, there's people in the booking committee that want to replace you. And the only reason I know this was the summer of 99, because that was the all-star game summer. And that I knew where I was. 
And I said, it was Terry Taylor, right? He said, I'm not saying names. I just know that they want to replace you. Uh, and so Terry came to me later, and Terry said, uh, I Craig called you, I know, and said there were people here wanting to replace you. I'll tell you right up front, I think that you can do better work. I said, okay. Uh, Terry, I think we can have a better product. If you give me a better product, maybe I can do better work. So Terry was kind of upfront with me about that. So there was always a pull and a tug about who should be the announcers. And uh, Russo liked me, always did like me, and he kept me on board to do any stuff. So, um, but I always like working with Bobby better than anybody. So, honestly. Matt, so Madden replaces Bobby, and, and what do and, you... And did a good job. What do you hear, or what do you think is going to be next for Bobby, and how would you categorize your relationship with him at the time? Were y'all friendly, uh, or had, had the, yeah. had the, was the bloom already off the rose? No, the bloom wasn't off the rose at all. We were friendly. Look, I was put into a pretty tough spot because I was, uh, I was in charge of all the announcers, which means I uh, was in charge of the travel or make sure they had their travel in. I, I'm supposed to give announcers reviews, which was bullshit, but that's the way corporate wanted it done. And I just said, okay, I'm writing up your review. I'm sending it in. I'm not going to even talk to you about it. We just would laugh about it. Uh, but we still had a pretty good relationship. We really did. So at that point, is Bobby, you know, communicating to you that he's job scared or nervous about this or how does Bobby no. receive this news? No, he's not. And, and again, Bobby is coming in and doing the work in the studio and I'm not always in the studio when he's there. One of the things that Bobby, uh, when we uh, got together in 2003 said to me, and, and really if I, if I think about it, he's right. He said, you and I live close to each other. We really did. He moved to the Atlanta area. Uh, I, I don't know what year he moved, and he moved very close to me. He said, you never came to my house. I went to his house uh, once during a Christmas party. He said, you never called, never came to our house, so you just completely shut me off. Yeah, he's right. I, I did. Well, uh, I'm just curious. Does, does Bobby Heenan's phone make outbound calls? Yes. Does Bobby Heenan I, I, have the, a driver's license? Could he have driven to your house? Yes. So w w why is the onus with Bobby on everyone else to maintain a relationship? I, I don't know. I don't know. But that's that's what he told me. I remember him saying, never invited me to your house. Well, no, I didn't. <laughs> you don't want to come to my house, guys. I've got five kids and things are fucking nuts. It really is. Our, our house is not, is not uh, invite friendly. Uh, we never have people at our house. I mean, yeah, I, I we used to years that, ago. But, I, I've never been invited either. Yeah. Um, so he talks about knowledge is power. He'd never tell you what was going on. He is a very insecure man. Yeah, it, he's it, right. I'm, I'm, I'm insecure about a lot of things, but not, I was never insecure about my job. Let me ask you I'm this. In, I'm, in, I'm insecure about money. You know that. Sure. I'm insecure about, uh, the way this country is going. Oh God! I'm insecure go. about my weight, okay. uh, but I was never insecure about my job. I don't trust a lot of people above me. This is the worst letters to penthouse ever. <laughs> um, Tony always had to have the higher chair in the middle. He told the yeah, stage hands that he had to have the middle chair higher. He would sit Stop down that. and I would reach for the lever. So he'd sink. He got so mad at that. Tony yeah. was a real minor leaguer. For no reason other than to look like the WWF, management decided to change the look of Nitro and move us down to ringside, where, by the way, it's hotter with the lights on you. Tony decided to change his look and wear a leather jacket to the set. Right. I think he should have checked the calendar as it was July. He was soaking wet the whole night, and Tony <laughs> Schiavone doesn't keep well in warm weather. Uh, so let's talk about... The middle right. chair, because this is everywhere. Yeah. I mean, everybody has believed this yeah. for years and years now. And let's talk about right. when you decided to become. Uh, yeah, that was me freestyling to become leather jacket. And, and I remember Eric looked at me one time and said, you look silly. And I said, yeah, you're right. I do. Uh, well, <laughs> it, right. here's what you should have did. You should have said, my wife picked this out. And that's what you can say. <laughs> if you go to ProWrestlingTees.com forward slash WHW, you can pick up the my wife picked this out shirt. Maybe one of my favorite shirts there. We've also got hypothetically what a slap dick 
Flair hit it first. And the two top sellers right now, evil, mean, and nasty. But number one with a bullet, damn, I am good. Uh, speaking of bullets, glass bottom boat ride tours from Bill is still there. WCW, uh, it was like a coffin on roller skates. We've got As the. We are describing here, right? Exactly. Uh, yeah. Parker's Jump Rope Academy. I got lots of tweets over the weekend of people sporting the hot tag shirt. Uh, Lois may rule, uh, but her decor for the way she would decorate her husband, her choices for ensembles maybe weren't always a home run, but Lois still rules, and you can pick that shirt up. Or I'm a Tom Zink guy. Even Tom Zink right. would have been blushing uh, seeing you in all leather here. So pick up a shirt right now, ProWrestlingTees.com forward slash WHW. And eventually, uh, with, if and when Tony Schiavone ever returns home, he will give you a call and thank you for picking up a shirt. Right, Tony? Absolutely. Absolutely. I've enjoyed all the phone calls. It means it, honestly, it, it just, it just kind of, uh, takes me aback, blows me away that people would buy a, a, a shirt, uh, and would, would be so appreciative of what we have done in the past. And Conrad, there's a lot of guys out there that say a lot of great things about you when I call them. A lot of great things. And I, I think you should know that too. Well, and I always respond by saying, yeah, he's full of shit. Well, that but explains, you know, Bobby Heen and I have a lot in common because we both think you're a real minor leaguer. Um, <laughs> so can you respond? Let, let me, yeah. Can I respond to this, this chair thing? Yeah, let's do it. Okay, l- let's do I always like my chair high, but I never thought my chair should be higher than Heenan's. And Heenan used to always grab my chair, and I would go way down. And I thought it was a fucking gag, and I would get back up, and I would take it, and I would go up, and he would go way down again. And I would laugh, thinking it was fucking Heenan being Heenan. But I never thought that he thought that I, my chair should be higher than his. Well, you know. Maybe, the, the- maybe, maybe by my annex, annex that, I can see where he would think that. But I always thought it was funny because he would hit that button and down I would go. Isn't it true that one of the reasons you wanted to lift your chair is you're a short little fucker? No, well, yeah, that's true. So, Absolutely. I, you know, yeah. maybe he just thought you had some sort of weird leather jacket Napoleon complex. <laughs> that sounds right to me. But he did a lot of crazy shit, man. He did a lot of crazy stuff and uh, it made us laugh, I mean, a lot. And so that was one of them. And, uh, if that's a way of, uh, <laughs> that's a way of heaping shit on me. Fine. Because at the time it was funny. Let's keep going in the book here. Tony has not okay. spoken to me since I left WCW. He never said goodbye to me. He knew it was coming, but he never told me that they weren't going to renew me. If knowledge is power, he wanted that power. And the time I worked for him, he never had me over to his house. Even once, even though we live close to each other, I had him over to my house twice. After I was released from WCW, I was out on New Year's Eve with the Tanays in Atlanta. My wife went to use the restroom downstairs. Cindy came back to tell me that Tony and his wife were at the bar. I walked downstairs and sat across from the bar from Tony and just stared at him. Tony saw me and then would try to avoid looking at me. Finally, he left. The next day, he told Tanay that he and his wife had to go home. They couldn't even eat because they were so upset. He couldn't figure out why I would stare at him and not acknowledge him. I told Mike what to tell him. It's obvious I can't trust you. It's obvious you don't like me. There's nothing to say. So if I can't trust you, I'm going to watch you. I ruined his New Year's. Do you recall? Yeah, he did. Do you remember this? Oh, yeah, he did. Uh, And he stared at us, and I I didn't know whether to walk over. I should have walked over and said, Bobby, I'm sorry. I didn't. One of the guys at the bar who worked there, he said, if you and your wife want to have dinner here, I will make sure he goes away. And I said, no, I'm not going to cause a scene. We will just leave. But it was Mike Tanay who actually came downstairs and saw me. It wasn't Cindy. It was Tanay who came downstairs and saw me and went back up and told Heenan that we were there for New Year's Eve. Uh, Let me tell you exactly what happened when Bobby Heenan got fired and why I fucked it up and why he is really mad at me, which I can understand why. I got a call from Craig Leathers at my house who said, we are firing Bobby Heenan, or we have fired Bobby Heenan. And I said, okay, so now, you know, since I'm in charge of the announcers, do you want me to do it? Because, Craig, I shouldn't do it. He said, no, I've done it already. I've talked to him on the phone, and he has threatened a lawsuit. So I'm telling you, 
as your supervisor, do not call him. Do not have any contact with him because he's threatened our company with a lawsuit. And I said, okay, I won't call him. Realistically, I should have said, okay, I won't call him. Hung up the phone and turned around and called him. That's what I should have done. But I didn't. I didn't know it was coming. I didn't call him because Craig told me not to. And I should have because we had been very close. And we had been very good friends. And we had traveled up and down on the road together. So that was my mistake. And I'm sorry for it. I really am. And that's why he was angry at me. And, but to say that I knew it was coming, I did not. It, it, it surprised me. He wrote one week after I got sick with strep, Tony told me you're not going to be doing nitro. They're going to try out different guys to see how they'll work down the road. I said, okay, yeah. what do you want me to do? Do you want me to do the pay-per-views? I figured I would ask Vince Russo. I approached him and I asked him if he needed me for the pay-per-views. Tony ran up and stood right in front of me, probably winking at Russo. Russo said, I'll get back to you on that. He never did. About the same time, WCW was fighting a lawsuit over racial discrimination filed by a bunch of wrestlers who felt the company wasn't using enough minorities. Suddenly, they made Booker T the world champion. They had Stevie Ray do the announcing. The cat became the commissioner. If the allegations came up in court, WCW could defend themselves by saying they had a black world champion, a black commentator, and a black commissioner. They took me off Thunder and had me doing Worldwide, which was taped in Atlanta for syndication. It was just a horrible show with no production values. I was doing that once a week for 40 minutes. That was fine with me. I had lost my desire anyway. I didn't want to go to Sturgis, South Dakota, and all those goddamn places. So we'll cover that in a minute. But first... Do you remember this when you give him the news that he's not doing it anymore? He's asking Russo about pay-per-views and you allegedly jump in front and give the Iggy to Russo. No, that did not happen at all. I wouldn't have done that. I would never have done that. So he's just making this up. He's just lying. Uh, he's angry. So he's, an, he's, he's angry and maybe, and, and well, look, maybe he thought I did that. I, I, but I didn't, I would never do it. No. Not at all. The pay-per-views in Sturgis were dangerous. All the bikers arrived at noon, and the pay-per-views didn't start until 7 o'clock. They drank all day in the hot sun. There was no flooring, just gravel, which gave them something to throw. I did commentary with Tony Schiavone and Dusty Rhodes. When I walked out to the announcer's table, the people cheered, and I waved to them. Dusty nudged me and said, I thought you were a heel. And I replied, not when they have rocks and we're stationary. We wave to them, which is pretty (laughs) smart. All my desire was gone. I didn't know if it affected my performance because I didn't know if it was good or bad. No one ever told me. We all have good and bad days. There were some matches nobody cared about. There were some things you could just not hype. It's like a guy bringing you an 80-year-old hooker. She doesn't look good, so why does it matter? Um, Before we continue with kind of the end here, I wanted to ask you about the Sturgis pay-per-view because there's rumor and innuendo that Bobby did one of these shows. This is what I think he's referencing here. Kind of veiled that he did one of these shows drunk. Can you speak to that? Uh, I, uh, I thought his commentary that night was not that good. Uh, as I, I shouldn't say that I thought his commentary was not as, as it is usual. And I didn't seem drink that night. Didn't seem, I mean, it's not like he had a bottle of liquor underneath the stands or or underneath the desk or uh, a a beer that he was, I didn't see him drink at all. But as the event kept going on, he was more and more or less Bobby Heenan. The only thing I can tell you is, is that you need to watch the pay-per-view yourself and make a decision for yourself. Help me understand what year you're talking about here. 96, 97, 98, 99. Do you remember? I don't know. I don't know. Do you remember what you were wearing? Is this the time you were dressed like a gay biker? It, it could have been. Okay. Did Bob, did Bobby and, and Dusty and I, how many events did we do in Sturgis together, the three of us? I know oh. it was a three-man crew. But it, but definitely Dusty was there, you're saying? Yes. Okay. Definitely. It was a three-man crew. Um, he talks about the end here, and he says, In November of 2000, my contract was up in December, but with an option for another year. My telephone rang. They didn't have the class to bring me in. Craig Leathers, who hired the beautiful Grey Poupon lady, so he just added himself, called me. I thought, oh no, they're going to re-up me. 
And he says, quote, they've decided not to pick up the option for the next year. How come? I asked you make too much money for what you do. He said, I said, give me more to do. And he said, there isn't anything to do. I replied, you took me off nitro thunder and pay-per-views. You're paying three people to do what I did and still paying me my money. Then Craig had the balls to ask me if I would work until the end of the year. Quote, Craig, you just fired me. You want me to work until the end of the year? I'll tell you what. I've never taken a vacation in the six years I've been here. I have three coming. I'll take the first three weeks of December off and come back for the last week. I sure hope I'm not rusty. Needless to say, I didn't come back. They wanted me to sign a piece of paper to get paid until the end of the year, but I said I wouldn't knock WCW in any way or make fun of them. They sent me the paper. I sent it to my attorney. They sent me another paper and said that if I didn't sign that paper and send it back, they'd consider it signed. They wanted to make up their own rules. That's how that company was run. My time in w- my time in WCW was over. I wasn't worried. I'd save my money. I always told Cindy, two can eat cheap as long as one of you don't eat." So help me understand the end well, here and the way you, you remember it. I, the way I remember is what I just told you. Right. Is that uh, what, what Craig now, you know, Craig told me that Bobby had threatened a lawsuit. Craig had been lying to me. I don't know. Right. That's what I mean uh, is that wasn't referenced at all in, in his story. Right. But, uh, right. and I want to talk about, cause this is on the online. You can look this up. His last appearance was from November of 2000. It was a worldwide episode with Scott Hudson. Uh, you're at least uh, friendly with Scott Hudson. Did you ever have a conversation with him about working with Bobby at the end? Uh, yeah. Uh, Scott who was a big time wrestling fan. Loved working with Bobby. He thought that was just uh, quite a, uh, exciting for him to be working with Heenan. Uh, but as far as thinking Heenan had done bad work, Scott never said anything like that. A couple quick things I want to hit that I think you guys probably would have had in common. Bobby grew up a big baseball fan. Did you guys ever talk about baseball? Yeah, we did. We, uh, uh, Bobby uh, and I went to uh, the uh, great story, too. But that is one of my favorite stories, my favorite baseball stories of all time. Uh, we were working Hartford, Connecticut, and we had a day off uh, before we had to be to – we actually had two days off. We had to be to Thunder. And we went to the baseball playoffs. I'm thinking this is 1997, the Yankees and the Cleveland Indians. And we knew Gene Budick, who was the president of the American League. Gene Budick was a big wrestling fan. So uh, Gene Budick got us tickets to go see the ALCS. So Bobby said, let's get to the ballpark early because I know George, as in Steinbrenner, and I'm sure he'll see us. And I said, okay. And I knew Bobby knew George, but I thought George is not going to see us during the playoffs. So we go into the office there at Old Yankee Stadium. And he, Bobby walks right up to the receptionist. Uh, and he says, uh, Bobby Heenan here to see George Steinbrenner. And the receptionist says, okay, uh, I'll, uh, I'll make a call. And about five minutes, this guy, this little guy came down stairs, looked like he had been beaten up. And he said, oh, Mr. Heenan come this way. We walk into this elevator and I walk in with him. We go up, we go into George's office and there's George Steinbrenner there. And I'm thinking, holy shit, here we are in George Steinbrenner's office. And George said, so you guys got tickets? And we're sitting around this long table. And Bobby said, yeah. He said, uh, Gene Beauty got it for us. Uh, George said, let me see these tickets. And Bobby kind of throws across the table. George says, uh, well, we can do better than that. Bobby said, just give us a hundred dollars for each ticket. And we'll call it even. <laughs> <laughs> what a fucking line. Oh my God. George <laughs> so, uh, so George called somebody and the guy came up and George says, put these guys, put these guys down in our new section. They apparently had, and, they, and they've done this now. They've, they've moved the section forward, but this was before all the fancy sections behind home plate, but they built this section just for the playoffs and they plywooded it all from everybody else. And George says, these are great seats. I'll show you where they are. And so we went downstairs in the uh, elevator. We walked outside, and we went to our seats. And George Steinbrenner showed us to our seats. And that was all because of Bobby Heenan. And that's still one of my greatest baseball stories ever, that George Steinbrenner, friends of Bobby, would show us to our seats. How uh, amazing my, is that? Isn't that something? I had my picture taken with... Steinbrenner and Bobby Heenan, uh, 
when we were in Tampa at the fairgrounds at one time, because George is, you know, was really big into uh, civic in Tampa. And uh, so that was, <laughs> and Eden said, just give us a hundred bucks for each and we'll call it even. Uh, just, uh, that's just the way he was. And of course, George loved Bobby, absolutely loved Bobby. Uh, as, look, we all did. We all did. And, and, and I, I, I wish that it never came to this. Sure. But I, I, te- I take full responsibility for it again because the way I acted the day he was fired or the way I didn't act let me, the day he was fired. Let me ask you this. If Bobby wasn't in the physical condition he's in right now, would you be apologizing like this or would you start throwing some hate? No. No. I'd say, I, no, I, I wouldn't. I Here, Bobby, in, in 2003, Bobby and I were, we went to Cincinnati. Uh, and to a claim. Now, now keep in mind, when I was told I was going to go to uh, to a claim and voiceover video game with Bobby Heenan, I knew the last time I had seen Heenan, he had stared me down at a restaurant on New Year's Eve in Roswell, Georgia. So I'm thinking, oh boy, this is not going to be good. So we got there, and I remember Heenan said, "Could I talk to you for a second? So we walked in the back of this little kitchen, and Heenan laid it all out for me. I was upset that you didn't. Uh, and this was, again, after, I guess, he did his stuff for RF video. I was upset that you didn't call me. Here's what I thought that you did. Here's the way I thought you acted. He said, there was a lot of people backstage that thought that you were keeping things from people. And I said, Bobby, I wasn't. I really wasn't. I was just aloof. I was removed from things. And we started talking, and he shook my hand. And we hugged, and he said, call me. When you get back from all this, call me. We did our work, went out to lunch, we saw each other, and he said, don't forget to call me. And I said, I won't, and guess what? You didn't call him. I didn't call him. And I did call after he got real sick, and I talked to Cindy. Cindy said he was too sick to talk, but I should have called him. I should have stayed up with him. I should have. So I'm assuming now that because I didn't call him after 2003 – that he is pissed off at me again. I don't know. I don't know if he is or not. Do I have this right? Bobby first got diagnosed with throat cancer in 99. I mean, he was still working with you at the time, right? Mm. The first I think I remember of it, uh, was, uh, we, uh, and now I got to change my story, but we were at the XWF TV tapings. Right. And I didn't really see Bobby that much, but he did some things. And I could tell that when he went out and did an interview that his mouth was not working too well. Uh, that's when I, I had first heard about it. And that had to be, what, 2001? Did he get diagnosed with throat cancer in 99? I, I didn't hear that. I, I thought it was 99. Is that what the I mean, book says? I could okay. be mistaken. Um, yeah. Let's talk about his description of the way you kind of handle commentary. He said... In reality, wrestling doesn't need a play-by-play guy. Most play-by-play guys come from radio where you'd have to describe everything no one, because no one was seeing it. You don't need to do what Tony Schiavone does. It was best when it was me and Mike Tanay, and we would talk about the angle they were working, what would happen the next time the two wrestlers met, and what they were capable of doing. How do you feel about his criticism of your play-by-play style? Uh, Well, I thought Mike and I kind of did the same thing. Uh, and, uh, he's right. You don't have to call everything. If you're a radio announcer, you don't have to call all the bumps. Uh, and I always said that, uh, but they wanted us to put over every crazy high spot as being crazy and nuts. But to say that, uh, to say that you had to ignore the match and talk about what they did next time. I, I, I never did agree with that theory. I thought if you made the match seem important and made the wrestlers seem important, and it made their uh, opponents seem important as well. Uh, let's run through uh, some of the things that I know you would like to touch on uh, before we get out of here, because we've covered a lot, but there's some stuff that, you know, was, isn't all negative, I guess. I, I know that you've had some fun stories. You told me once about uh, somewhere in Maryland at a convenience store, a gas station in New Jersey, something at a hotel in Pensacola. So there's some, some interesting stuff in here that we can throw in. So it's not such a downer. Give us some fun Bobby memories. 
Well, uh, Heenan used to always be on for the announce crew. I used to drive. Heenan would sit in the front. Tanae would sit in the back. A lot of times when Dusty was with us, sometimes Dusty would sit in the front and Heenan would sit in the back with Tanae. And then Lee Marshall would be with us sometime. But I always drove because I like to drive. Uh, and I remember one time we went into a convenience store in Salisbury, Maryland after our show. And we just knew that Bobby was up to something. And Bobby would do something like, okay, get ready or watch what I'm going to do here. And he walks up with a, I don't know what he had. He could have had sodas, could have had beer or whatever. He walks up to the, the counter where this big lady is. And on the counter are all these different things. You know, they have placards with uh, maybe gum to sell, or now they have 24-hour uh, energy to sell. they up on that. And Bobby does one of his pratfalls and falls forward and knocks down everything on the counter. Everything goes splat. And the lady goes, oh, oh. And he says, oh, gee whiz, I'm sorry. It's, it's been a long day. Let me help you pick it up. So now he's trying to help her pick things up. And the more he's picking things up, the more he's making things worse. And now he reaches and he said, here, let me have this. And he reaches towards her and he accidentally hits her in the boob. He goes, oh, gee whiz, I'm sorry. I'm just, I'm, I'm very sorry. And she says, okay, that's okay. I'll pick it up. That happened more than once. That happened in Maryland. That happened in New Jersey where he would do a pratfall like that to make us all laugh. And of course we would have to run out, you know, holding our, you know, trying to try not to laugh, but it was just Heenan being Heenan. One time we pulled up to a, a, a place in New Jersey. It was a, uh, it was a gas station and it was odd. You would pull up to the gas station and this was back in the nineties. And then you would pull up after the gas station, there would be this person sitting there and then you would pay for it. So we pulled up, and there was this huge, fat, black lady in there. And I knew Hina was going to say something smart. So I pulled up to her, and I just cracked the window ever so slowly could I, so I could slide out the, the credit card. And Hina said, is there any air left in there? And we all laughed again. Uh the best story, though, was when we were in Pensacola, and we used to take the first flight out every morning uh, back to Atlanta. And we're talking about early morning, and there was always a bunch of us did that, production people and us. I was always there. Tanae was always there. Heenan was always there. And there was one clerk checking us out in Pensacola. And this is not the days where the, the Marriott slides your bill underneath the, the door. This is the Pensacola Hotel, whatever it is. And we're all in a line there. There's this old guy buffing the floor in the mornings. And he has the orange extension cord across where we are lined up. And Heenan says, all right, I got something. And as Heenan wraps his leg around the slack of this extension cord, as much as he could do it, and then when it was his turn to come to the, to the front, he trips pulls out the extension cord. It pulls out from the plug. The buffer goes out of the guy's hands and Heenan now is grabbing the extension cord, trying to get it off his, his foot and he pulls it up and now he's fighting with the extension cord like it's a fucking gimmick match and like it's this big snake. And he's going back and forth and back and forth and just doing an over-the-top show for all of us at 4 o'clock in the morning. And then he finally gets it down and we help him pull it off and he goes up to the front and he falls forward and knocks things down on the counter. That was Bobby Heenan. It happened all the time, and we loved him for it. And uh, he just continued to do things and and uh, make us make us laugh. He also was very, and I can understand this because he was a heel and a good heel at one time. Bobby was also very afraid of fans because fans, as as you know, could probably you know. Uh, as a heel back in the old days could really get on you. Sure. One time, one time we were at Boston at the, at the new garden and it was me and Lois and Karen today and Mike today and Lee Marshall and Bobby we were all going to crowd in this car together and we would all lock our stuff in the car and, uh, so that we could run out and beat the crowd out. And we made the mistake of giving our keys to Lee Marshall. Lee never did, could see too well. They always had thick glasses and Bobby always called him goo. 
Mr. Magoo. He called him Goo. And so I gave the keys to Lee, and Bobby said, oh, fuck, Goo's got the keys. We'll never get the car. Well, we didn't. And we got the car late. We got in the car, and I think Tanae may have driven the car this time, or maybe I was driving. And the fans came out, and they saw Heenan and start banging on the car. Boom, 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 as we're trying to back out uh, this parking lot and uh, get way down. It looked like, I think it was Little Alley that went to the left of the uh, – of the uh, arena there and they were banging on the car and Heenan was in full panic mode. He was like, you guys don't understand these fans. These these fans are crazy. I mean, they, they were, they were shaking the car and they were pounding on it. Hey, weasel Bobby, the brain Heenan. And he was excited and he was upset. Uh, And uh, there was a lot of times that things didn't go right on the road that he would get very upset and get very panicky about it, especially when it came to the fans. So, so those are some of the things that I remember about Bobby. But it was always a treat traveling with him. It really was. Because he, he kept us entertained. Let's he get, was the brain. Let's get one last Tony Schiavone day again. Uh, he <laughs> talks about when he comes back to the company uh, for the gimmick battle royal. He's back for the WWF. They're doing WrestleMania. They've got the gimmick battle royal. Uh, he is talking to Mean Gene Okerlund. Uh, and he starts calling Mean Gene Tony. And he right. wrote in his book. As in Shivani, it wasn't a mistake. It was on purpose. But thinking about it, I should have known better than to confuse the two. Gene has talent and a job. <laughs> That's brain. That's him. Uh, he is funny. He's irreverent. And he's pissed off at me. And I don't blame him. Well, let's, uh, let's get to some fan questions. We asked you to join the conversation over at WHW Monday. We're going to do some fan questions, and then we're going to tell you what we've got in store for you next week, and it's something special. Stay tuned for that. But first, uh, real quick, Nick Startup wants to know on Twitter, did Bobby's quick wit ever get him into a physical altercation with any of the boys? No. The Starcade boys want to know, was Bobby Heenan a shot in a beer, a cheese and wine, or a martini type of guy? He was a martini type of guy. Uh, Adam Gillespie. Uh, wants to know, did he ever get any heat from the boys about something he said, or did everyone understand it was in good fun? Everyone understood it was in good fun. And Adam Gillespie, go fuck yourself. Uh, Billy Real wants to I know. I know, Adam. I, that's why I said that. I okay. Uh, Billy Real wants to know, did Bobby Heenan have rats? This is hilarious to me that somebody would ask <laughs> this about an elderly Bobby Heenan, but was he popular with the uh, the female wrestling fans? The uh, I don't remember that. I don't remember any of us, any of the announced team being uh, very popular with the female wrestling fans. They were there for the boys. Um, the Starcade boys want to know who was quicker with a comeback, Bobby Heenan or the Nature Boy? Bobby Heenan was quicker than anybody I've ever met in my life. Matt wants to know, did Bobby Heenan ever wear jeans or was it always black slacks 24-7? Never wore jeans that I saw. He never uh, even wore jeans when we were wearing jeans in Sturgis, you know, me and uh, Dusty. Bobby didn't wear jeans that day. Here's one of the more popular links that we got this week. Uh, Kurt Bush fan is one of the first guys to mention it. Ask about the time Bobby laughed an entire Jim Duggan match. Yeah. Do you remember this? Yes, I do. What can you share Absolutely. with us about it? Well, it was, it was, it was spectacular. And I go back at two of the, two of the things that I remember about uh, working with Heenan was he just, I was trying to explain how Jim Duggan was wrestling an intelligent match and Heenan was trying to put over the fact that Duggan was stupid and he just laughed at the entire match. If you find it, it is one of the gr- great Heenan, uh, matches ever working with me. The other one was when I, uh, talked about a mafia kick. Oh yeah. And that's out there. And he, good stuff. Yeah. He, and that's good stuff. He and Dusty both got on me for calling it a mafia kick. We will link uh, both of those uh, to Twitter. So go ahead oh, yeah. and, and follow us on Twitter. We'll have links to both of those. They're out there. Uh, they're, J- they're outstanding. Both of them are. Jason wants to know, and we got this question a lot. Uh, are you? Can you address the um, the rumor and innuendo about mm-hmm. you having an issue with Bobby Heenan saying goodbye to Gorilla Monsoon on air? Yeah, I can uh, tell you that whole story. Uh, it goes back to me being in charge of the announcers, and a lot of times. If something happened that went on the air that Eric didn't like, Eric would go to me and say, why did you guys say that? 
and I would a lot of times say, Eric, explain you guys. Is it me? So anyway, Bobby said during a commercial break, he said, I'm going to say something about Gorilla Monsoon's death. And I said to him, did you check with Eric about this? Does he know it's coming? Because if he doesn't know and he, and he's upset about it, he's going to give me shit. Bobby said, I don't care. I'm going to do it. I said, okay, that's fine. So I guess by me saying, did you check with Eric is, was Bobby, uh, interpreting that I didn't want to say it when in fact, Gorilla Monsoon was a, was a big part of my career. I worked with him with challenge and loved him. So that video is out there and I think it's overhyped. I would challenge everybody to go watch this. It's all over the internet when, uh, it's on nitro of course. And it's yeah. Bobby and you are sitting at the desk and you actually tee it up to Bobby. So yeah. you, you mention it and then just hand it off to him so he can do it. And he's obviously emotional, but right. if it was something that you were against, like the rumor and innuendo would be, he would have just slipped it in on his own. You wouldn't have teed it up for him. No, I, I was, and I, again, I was just wanted to make sure that Eric knew because An- Eric would have listened and Eric would have gotten on my ass. So the angry barista asks any fun stories <laughs> or interactions with Bobby and Klondike bill. No, none that I know of. Although, Cl- although Bobby knew that Klondike was one of the great perverts of all time. Everybody did. The it was uh, common knowledge. I think everybody on, on Twitter here has, has cracked the code here. The Bobby Heenan drinking episode of Sturgis was Hogwild 96. They say okay. particularly during the Hogan Giant match. So if you're interested, right. uh, that's maybe where you can find it. Uh, Joe has a great question here. Um, where do you rank Bobby the Brain Heenan as an all-time color commentator? We, we started the show by talking about he's number one best as a manager. What about his color? Bobby Heenan is all time. Number one, uh, with Jesse Ventura being a close second, as far as who I worked with. Uh, and after that, you can group them all in. But as far as a color commentator, as far as a commentator who added color and sizzle and pizzazz, Bobby was the best by far. Jim Ross said he was my color commentator. He was not. Both Jim Ross and I did play-by-play. Right. So I can't really put Jim in there, but I love working with JR. But Bobby was the best by far. Mikey wants to know, is there any talent that you knew of that Bobby couldn't stand or maybe refused to put over? Uh, I know that he did not like uh, he did not like a match with the Nasty Boys because he thought they were nuts. So uh, what, and, not about uh, their work, just about their real-life behavior? Yes. Yeah, absolutely. That they were just nuts and you couldn't trust anything they would do. And I know he didn't like, uh, he never did like, and and I didn't like it either when we had anything to do with big Papa pump late, you know, late in the run because Scott was, was pretty, uh, was pretty nuts. Have I told the story about JJ coming out and said that he is going to find uh, Scott Steiner, uh, for his antics, and Scott and JJ's going to do it at the desk, and uh, and JJ said this is something they did where they did it in prompt too. JJ, I guess, was the commissioner or the president of WCW back then. And JJ said, "So I'm going to this during the commercial break." JJ says, "I'm going to find Scott Steiner for his antics," and he said, "Scott's going to come out, and before he can ever get to the set, I'm going to jump down and stop him." And I went, "Really?" And he said, "Yes." And so at JJ finished talking to me and he looked at me and he says, fuck this. I'm gone. And I don't know if you remember seeing that, but as soon as Scott Steiner came out, as soon as he walked out, we ran. Wow. And of course, Scott Steiner went nuts and I think destroyed things and all that stuff. So Rodney SD was- has a great question there. He says, and we got lots of questions of this variation. He spoke highly of Hogan in his first book, but I've heard he doesn't like Hogan. What was your understanding of their relationship? I feel like there's a blurring of the lines here where people are believing the character and the real life situation. I'm maybe getting confused to the best of your understanding. What was his relationship like with Hulk Hogan? Best of my understanding. He had no problem with Hogan. Again, it's Bobby Heenan being the manager of Andre, the giant 
And Bobby Heenan, throughout his commentary, you even say that you can't trust this guy. You can never trust Hulk Hogan. And that was a part of Heenan, to me, being one of the top heels and Hogan being one of the top baby faces throughout the years. Uh, another question here on Twitter. Did you guys hang out after the shows? If yes, where would Bobby like to go? I mentioned this because during a shoot interview with our video, he said that after the shows, he would go have a cocktail because what else was there to do? He wasn't going to go drink Ovaltine at nine o'clock at night like Tony Schiavone. Yeah, I, I did. I didn't hang out with. I didn't hang out with him. Uh, sometimes I did. I remember I went uh, to a place called the the Palomino in Indianapolis and had a drink with him because uh, uh, that was his home. Uh, but I never did really uh, go out with him, uh, and I don't do much. That's I would true. Go back to the hotel. Yeah, I really you're, don't. You're super boring. Hey. Yeah. Um, a friend of ours once told me that he went to uh, a gentleman's establishment with the brain. And he says that those, uh, girls were walking around like they were something special. All they had was a torn pocket. <laughs> that, uh, that was, uh, the word, the term torn pocket was a, a term that he used a lot. And, and torn pocket. He, uh, you when, know, can I can I also give you a story that Heenan used to say? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> you're gonna like this. Heenan used to used to, and Heenan could be very very gruff and very uh, oh forward. He could just forwarding. He could just say things that were were at, at times we thought was funny, but in in uh, in hindsight they were probably very unkind. I I saw him tell women. <laughs> He said, uh, uh, can I smell your pussy? Oh. And they would say, no. And he would say, oh, it must be your feet then. <laughs> we have to end the show right now. <laughs> Is that not great? We're not. <laughs> we're not going to beat that. Um, I don't know yeah, what to are. say right now. L l let me ask. I was saving this one for last. This is a downer, uh, but it is a valid question, especially given all that we know about your relationship. Would you go to Bobby Heenan's funeral? Yes. Okay. So there you go, would boys be, and girls. Would I be welcome at his funeral? I don't know. I hope I would, but yes, I would. Let's go ahead and tell you what we guys have in store for you next week. First of all, if you haven't already, please find us on social media. You can find the show at WHW Monday. You can find Tony on Twitter at Tony Schiavone 24. I'm over at Hey, Hey, it's Conrad. And you can like us on Facebook, which is what we're asking you to do right now. It's facebook.com forward slash WHW Monday. And Tony, I reached out to you this week and I gave you a heads up that we're almost to the 20 year anniversary of something really, really special. It's the time that Lex Luger beat Hulk Hogan on Nitro to become the world champion. That happened all the way back in 1997. And it's a really big deal at the time. It pops one of the biggest ratings of all time. It happened just one day uh, after the WWF presented SummerSlam 97 uh, and, and easily one of the biggest moments in WCW history. And we would like to review that for you and we'd like to do it on the anniversary. So our next episode we'd like to give you is all about the August 4th, 1997 Monday Night Nitro. It's available on the network. It's two hours and 23 minutes. And Tony and I will break down that Nitro and actually give you some, some running color and play-by-play -play and just have some fun as we watch that show together. So if you'd like to see that, don't watch the show in advance. Watch it with us. And we'll kind of give you the director's commentary all the way through. Now, in order for us to do that on the anniversary, we need to post the show on Friday, the 4th. And we'd like to do that for you. But here's what we're asking. Go on over to Facebook right now. Facebook.com forward slash WHW Monday. And when we get to 7,500 likes, which isn't that tall of an order, we're more than halfway there right now. We're going to go ahead and post that show early. So that's what we're looking for. 7,500 likes at facebook.com forward slash WHW Monday, and we'll release the 20 year anniversary of Monday Night Nitro, where Lex Luger beat Hulk Hogan for the world title. Tony, one of the biggest moments in Nitro history. Wouldn't you agree? Yeah, I don't think there was any question, uh, and uh, it's a memorable night. 
and I look forward to talking about it with you. If we cover that one in time, you're going to be hearing about Ric Flair and Diamond Dallas Page. There's some some luchador stuff in there. Uh, Sting comes down from the rafters. He's got an offer from J.J. Dillon. There's lots of fun stuff on this show that we think is worth talking about and breaking down in long form. We're going to have a great time just reliving some of the fun memories from Nitro 20 years ago. And we're going to go ahead and tell you about the next poll, too. We talked about it a lot today. The Sturgis events were almost to an anniversary there. Everybody remembered that was WCW's August show. They did it every August from 1996 to 1999. It was in Sturgis. Whose idea was this? How did this come about? Uh, what a shit show this was. We'll break it down in long form. Uh, the four topics are Hogwild 96, of course, Road Wild 97, Road Wild 98, and Road Wild 1999. That poll will be up at WHW Monday. But first, let's cover this Nitro where Luger wins the world title from August 4th, 1997. And again, don't watch it without us. Watch it with us. Uh, that's the plan for next week. Anything else we want to kind of talk about here, Tony, before we wrap this one up? Uh, no, I just want to uh, put a bow on this by saying that I miss Bobby Heenan. Uh, it is my fault again, uh, but the, why he is angry at me, and I can understand that. I made a mistake, and it won't be the last mistake I make uh, with friends, uh, but uh, he was the great. He was the, when Bobby Heenan was in his element, there was nobody better and nobody funnier. Uh, and, um, he was misused at WCW. I'm not going to take blame for that. Uh, but, uh, I will take blame for the way our, our, we parted because I, uh, I, again, I should have said, okay, Craig, I, I won't call him and should have said, yeah, fuck you hung up and then called Bobby back. And I didn't. So, well, I I, I hope that somebody who's close to Bobby now hears this podcast and plays it for him. And he has an opportunity to hear how you really felt. Because this has kind of been one of those long-standing um, rivalries in wrestling that we've heard about, where these guys have heat, but there's seemingly no resolution, and it doesn't feel like there needs to be any sort of heat at this stage. I hope not, because I think uh, time heals all, and I uh, hopefully he's. Uh, I know his health is not good, but uh, I just uh, I really miss the time we had together. I really do. Well, let's go ahead and all hope for the best with Tony Schiavone and Bobby Heenan. And most of all, you know, it would be great if there was some sort of miraculous recovery or some sort of modern medicine miracle that could get Bobby Heenan to where he could enjoy life to the fullest. We certainly remember all the great memories that he's given us over the years. And I'm glad we were able to clear up some rumors and innuendo here today. But Tony, when I look at the time, I can't help but think we've went kind of long today. All right, today's main event on what happened when is a do it jobby prison match. The WHW world champion, the modern day redneck Maharaja Conrad Thompson, will face the challenger, La Serpiente Mori Grande, Dave Silva. Both men, a total combined weight of 1,200 pounds. Yikes! Now they're lowering the do it jobby prison. This incredible monstrosity is made of steel reinforced Slim Jims. Get a little stipend, have it on Slim Jim. Oh, what an awesome sight. And here are the rules. There are eight doors, two on each side. Each door will open for 56.7 seconds. Then it'll close. Unless the combatants are hungry or have to take a shit, at that time the match will be over. There are no countouts, no disqualification or disqualifications, if that's the way you like to say it. The only way to win the match is to go out one door, in through the other, out through the third, and then climb up the steel reinforced Slim Jim cage. Slim Jim! Not slipping on the beefy, juicy taste and escaping. Confused? Well, welcome to the fucking club. There will be no twist of fate, no swanton bombs, no empire elbows, no sister abigails, no shatter machines, no disarmers, no boom drops or poetry in motions or any other silly ass bullshit names for high spots. And before the match gets underway, let's meet our international broadcast teams. First of all, the German broadcast team, consisting of Hans Schwagenhuber and the angry German kid from YouTube. While they are ready, 
Uh, at least I think so. And now our Spanish broadcast team of El Guapo de Rosa and Miguel Alonso. Ya por la mierda, yo no voy para allá. No le viste esta mañana, hijo de puta. Yo no voy para allá. No, 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 no. Tú estás loco. Por un momento era que yo quería irme para allá, pero no te por la mierda. Mami me dijo que no me metiera aquí. Y yo todavía estoy aquí metido. Por culpa tuya. Yikes. And finally, fans, our redneck broadcast team from Huntsville, Alabama. Here's Casio and Big Booty Judy. Thanks very much, Tony Schiavone. There's no question that where we're from, Conrad Thompson is the overwhelming favorite. However, one must wonder how his two henchmen, the Zimmermans, will get involved. Hell, they might be hiding under the ring. And if you get Justin and Chelsea under the ring, they may stay under there for a long time. But Big Booty Judy, what are your thoughts on this incredible do a jobby prison match? I don't care about this bullshit gimmick match. Fuck this. I just came to drink beer, eat nachos, and maybe see a button on a fur coat backstage. Well, Judy, you can go take a poop with your pants on, man. Back to you, Tony. Okay, then. Thanks, guys. Well, the combatants have now been closed off by the outer prison, and now they must get into the ring. Uh, but wait! Neither one will fit through the door! Holy shit! They must eat their way into the ring through the steel-reinforced Slim Jim cage. Step into a Slim Jim! And we are desperately out of time. The tape machines are rolling. We'll see you next week on WHW What Happened When on the MLW Radio Network. The world of MLW Radio never stops. 